Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com and in this video here, we've been studying together in the uh, book of 1 John, uh, verse by verse, and we're in the second chapter, and we're looking at uh, the first several verses. This video is going to concentrate on our walk, the Christian's walk. Now, that's, that's something that should interest, be of interest to just about every believer is and that is how we are to walk and the word walk uh, I'm going to use that in the sense of behavior conduct uh, our life uh, our life our relationship with God uh, as it's based on truth and so as we go forward I want to I want to thank you all for your continued interest in these studies in first John and so let's just get right to it In verse 1 of chapter 2, we saw that, that John was interested in writing these things in order that we sin not. And if you uh, f have been following us, you've probably uh, become aware of the fact that at least our position on that is, is not one of law, but grace. Uh, it's easy to suggest that, you know, we just don't sin. I mean, John says, I write these things that you sin not. So we just go about not sinning and that may sound like a simple answer but it's it's a little more detailed than that and i hope that uh, that's come across in the past several videos uh, whatsoever is not of faith is sin we we tend to to just simply look at sin uh, as a new testament christian under grace as uh, as something that we need to overcome by the flesh we need to overcome sin and to do that our our only alternative is to embrace law keeping as a rule of life which by this point by the time we've come this far in our studies of all these epistles of paul and uh, and in the first chapter of john we we should have i believe the holy spirit would have expected us to come to understand that everything is to be filtered through grace and through the the perfect finished work of Christ on our behalf. Dearly beloved, we're not under law, but we're under grace. And then in verse two, we talked a little bit uh, in the last video about propitiation, that God is fully satisfied with Christ's work on our behalf. The, the sin debt was fully paid. God was satisfied and it had to be not only for ours only that propitiation, but also for the sins of the whole world. And, uh, if you haven't seen that, that last video on propitiation, I highly recommend that you watch that before we go on, you go on further in our study here. God is propitiated, folks. He has nothing against us. We stand before God holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. And uh, all of Adam's transgression was removed in the death of Christ, even those who are not which what we would call uh, children of God.
uh, they're not elect, but their transgression was removed. And the reason for that is so that no man can stand before God on judgment day, that's the great white throne judgment, and, and say, well, why are you condemning me to hell because of something that Adam did? The transgression was removed in Christ, that's why all children go to heaven. But there comes a time, according to Romans 7, as we saw in our study through Romans, the, Paul reminds us in chapter 7 that we have, as far as the sin question is concerned, Romans 7 clearly teaches that we were alive once apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So we died at some point, and some people want to talk about that in the, in the sense of, the, uh, of some age of accountability, and, and Scripture is silent on when that occurs, but it occurs in every believer's life. There comes a time when the law comes in, the uh, uh, sin revives, and we die in our own sin, and now we have to be born again and I pointed out how that in Jude, I believe uh, uh, verse 12, or Jude 1, 12, uh, that we were shown that there are those w among us uh, within the congregation that are twice dead. That twice dead being that they died once in Adam, their sins were removed in Christ, uh, the law came in, the sin revived, they died. That's the, that's the second death. And if we're not born again, you remain in the second death and you wind up in Jude, uh, the second death, uh, doubly dead. And then, of course, uh, in the book of Revelation, we, we see that uh, at the great white throne judgment, that, that that's who these individuals are. They're doubly dead, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. So we go on in, in, in verse 3, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. That is guard, keep is not do. The word for do in the Greek is poieo. This is tereo, it means to guard, and we guard his commandments. And notice it's his commandments, not the 10 commandments, the commandments of Moses, uh, or all 630 some odd precepts of the law, including all the fence laws that the Pharisees set up. Uh, folks were not under law. We're, what we are interested in as New Testament Christians who were born again by the will of God and given a new nature which cannot sin, or that we stand fully righteous before God, our interest is in walking as who we are, not trying to become something that, we're, that we think that we're not. Dearly beloved, you stand before God without fault, spotless without fault. If more Christians knew this, it would, it would, it would have a dramatic impact on how they live their lives, on how they walk. Verse four, he that saith, I have known him, perfect tense, and keepeth, guard not his commandments, is a liar, a falsifier, and the truth is not presently in him. That's what the verse says. And then in verse five, but whoso keepeth guard, guards, present, that's a present tense, his word in him verily, that is truly, the love of God has been perfected. The love of God, not his love for God, but the, the love of God toward the believer is made complete, it's perfected, it's brought to maturity. You really truly understand that God loves you. And hereby we know that we are in him. And that word know, uh, as I pointed out, is gnosko. It's experiential knowledge. It's not a perfect knowledge. It's an experiential knowledge. And then verse 6, he that say, says that he abides in him ought, ought, that's the, the that's uh, the, uh, there's two words in the, in the New Testament in the Greek for ought. One is the, the the, the ought or the must of necessity. This is the must of obligation. So this is our, de this is our obligation that we are to walk uh, in the same way that He walked, our Lord walked. Now that's a high calling, okay? And, it, and if we're not careful, we're gonna put ourselves back under law in order to walk in the same way that He walked. Of course, that's, we know that that's not what the text is, is saying at all. That word walk, that's uh, peripateo in the Greek. It's, it's I conduct my life, I live, 
It's, it's as I pointed out, it's there's there's you never see the word walk in the New Testament used in it's never presented in the as a noun. Okay, uh, it's always a verb. At least I it, in all the years I've been, I've looked at that word walk, I've never seen it used as a noun. Like uh, this is our walk. Uh, there is a walk that we are to walk. That would be a noun. Uh, uh, it's always used as an action verb, uh, and that walk is, uh, out of 37 verses that I looked up, that's uh, relevant to this discussion, it, it's, it's, it's a compound word. It means from uh, it, uh, comprehensively around, uh, which intensifies the word for walk. It's the, the prefix of the compound word indicates that it's, it's a going around in a complete circle you're making a complete circuit so it is now I want to point out something uh, that I've pointed this out previously in past videos and it has to do with election which is not a very popular word among Christians today and we find uh, in John chapter 6 it's the spirit that quickens the flesh profits nothing the words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life but there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Clearly, you're looking at election there. And verse 66, this is John 6, 66, 3, 666. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. They were offended by the idea of election because Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, in clear words here in John chapter 6, took that decision away from them, made, made it absolutely certain to these individuals that God chose them that they didn't choose God. And the whole idea of us choosing God uh, which is a, a popular message today, which is not biblical, uh, is has as its roots, I mean, it's, uh, it, it really can be traced down to the whole idea of, of us wanting to uh, suppress God and elevate man. Uh, and so in a, in a very real sense, it's our wanting to be God. And this is John 6, 66. Just wanted to point that out. So as I went down through these verses, the verses where I found the word walk, and there were more than 37. I, I just, you know, due to time limitations, I can only really look at 37. We're looking at fellowship, uh, Romans 6, 4, we, that we should walk in newness of life, that is His life, resurrection life, because we've been crucified with Christ, buried and raised with Him to walk in, res in newness of life. That's the new man, not the old man. We're not cleaning up the old man. Uh, Romans 8, 1, uh, who walk not according to the flesh, that is law. Romans 8, 4, we do not walk according to the flesh. Uh, if we are walking according to the flesh, 1 Corinthians 3, 3 says we're walking as men. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7, 17, everyone so let him walk. This is all inclusive. This is the believer's walk. There's not my walk, your walk, and someone else's walk. This is our walk. 2 Corinthians 4, 2, not walking in craftiness. Uh, handling the Word of God deceitfully. All of this is in the context of walk. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Not by sight, not by circumstances, not by feelings, emotions, or anything else, but faith. And that plays a key role in, in our walk. Uh, you can't separate our faith from our walk. 2 Corinthians 10.2, again, uh, we're warned not to walk according to the flesh. 2 Corinthians 12.18, uh, we're walking in the same spirit. Uh, Galatians 5.16, we're to walk in the spirit. Ephesians 2.2 uh, talks about in time past, we walked in a way that was not consistent with how we are to walk today, which was according to the flesh. Uh, Ephesians 4.17, we're no longer to walk in the depravity of our mind, that is the old man, 
Uh, Ephesians 5.2, we walk in love. That's the new man. Uh, in 5.8, we walk as children of light. That's what we've seen here in our study in 1 John. Walk as children of light. That is, walk as children of truth. Ephesians 5.15, we're not to walk as unwise, but wise. Uh, Philippians 3.17, uh, we're to walk as, uh, to, be, as, to be a model or example to our fellow brethren. Uh, Philippians 3.18, uh, we don't want to be walking as enemies of the cross. That's the enemies of the cross, that which crucifies self. That, that which, uh, in which we fully see what occurred on the cross. And, and the cross, when we even begin to even talk about the cross, we, we, have, we cannot separate that from the work that Christ did on, on our behalf. The perfect finished work of Christ. And how that his death in our place was substitutionary, how that it was uh, sufficient, and we can't add anything to that. Uh, so we're not to walk uh, in him as enemies of the cross. We're to walk worthy of the Lord. We're to walk in him. Uh, it says that we once walked according to the old man in Colossians 3 7. Uh, Colossians 4 5 is walk in wisdom. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.12, God considers this walk worthy. It's, we're to walk worthy of God. That's, that's the new man. 1 Thessalonians 4.1, you ought to walk and to please God. And in fact, that's what the, the new man does. 1 Thessalonians 4.12, that you may walk honestly towards those who are on the outside. So we're an example to the non-believing world as to how we are to walk. And if we're not, if we're walking according to the flesh, if we're walking according to the law, folks, we're not walking any different than those who are on the outside who don't know Christ. Second Thessalonians uh, 3.11 is, speaks of walking disorderly. So there's an orderly way that we walk. Walking according to the law is walking disorderly. 1 John 1, 6, we're not to walk in darkness. Uh, 1 John 1, 7, we walk in the light. 2 John 1, 4, we're walking in truth. 2 John 1, 6, we walk according to His commandments. That is our Lord's commandments. 3 John 1, 3, we're walking in truth. Uh, in Revelation uh, chapter 3, we see that, uh, that we will walk with Him in white. In Revelation 6, 15, uh, we don't want to walk uh, in a way in which we uh, are naked and, uh, and people see our shame. So uh, in 1 John 2, 6, our walk is one in which we abide in Him. And I brought up, uh, I pointed you back to John chapter 15. He's the vine, we're the branches. We abide in Him. Apart from Him, we can do nothing. Uh, the way that we produce fruit in our life as a result of that walk of grace is that we abide in Him who is our life in which He produces in and through us what we could not possibly do on our own in and through ourselves. So how did Christ walk? How did He walk? Dearly beloved, God never intended us to go through life with our head down, worried about how we're going to fulfill the law uh, in the flesh, how that we, uh, uh, it, you know, are going to, Get, we must gain acceptance with God based upon our behavior. Folks, th that is not the Lord of, uh, uh, of this book. That is not the, the God I know. That is not the fellowship that I have with Him. It's not the fellowship that He wants to have with you. God never intended nor equipped you to bear, to carry, or to be burdened by the heavy yoke of slavery in your life. Our walk with Him is one that is intimate and personal, but it is based on truth and he has no no more no greater joy than to see us walking in truth so here we are we're learning how not to sin we we've learned that the answer to that is to believe whatsoever is not a faith is sin where we learned that our sins were atoned for by the blood of christ that god satisfied with that work of christ that it was sufficient uh, god is propitiated that we do sin we will continue to sin you, there's no question about that if we say we don't have uh, any sin uh, we're we're lying and the truth is not in us so we will sin yet christ jesus is our advocate he's you've got the best attorney 
He stands before the throne of God, uh, uh, countering the accusations from Satan who stands before God, accusing the brethren day and night. He points to the blood. God has nothing against us. Now, Satan would, would love to, and, and he does, he is quite successful, it seems, at this, of getting Christians to believe that God, somehow, to believe, to believe that God doesn't love them or that they have to earn God's love or acceptance, which is not the truth. We're to guard uh, His commandments. Uh, he's, he's the Word, the light, the truth. We are in Him. That is a, that is a day long sermon. We are in Him, in Christ, the very fulfillment of the law. This is our only walk, folks. It's our only walk. And then here we are just to see that the last mention of the word walk used in the Bible is, is in Revelation 21, 24, almost, almost at the end of the book, where the Lamb is the light thereof, the nations of, of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, that is the new Jerusalem hovering above, that's our heavenly abode. We are to abide in him now, and yet in Revelation 21, we see the new Jerusalem, which is our heavenly abode, being the very light that the nations of the earth walk in the light of. That source of light being Jesus Christ, our Lord. Do you know, we have to go back all the way to Genesis 3.8 to find the first mention of the word walk. And there, it's surprisingly, it's not our walk. It's, it's actually God walking in the garden. It's in this context, we see the, what I believe is the pre-incarnate Christ, God of very God, walking in the, in the pleasant breeze, the wind. In the Greek, you'll see it's wind. Uh, I think the authorized version says in the cool of the day. It was, a, it was a pleasant breeze blowing. He's walking in the garden. He's calling out. And, and who is he calling out to? Well, he's calling out to Adam. Adam, where art thou? And we know better than to believe in such, some, such foolishness as that, well, God didn't know where Adam was. Of course he knew where Adam was. But what we, this is subsequent to Adam's sin at the fall. Adam's already fallen. He's hidden with Eve among the trees. God's calling out to a sinless Adam that he once had fellowship with because that is the only Adam that he can have fellowship with. Are you getting this, folks? Are you getting this? The Adam that was sinless, that he wanted fellowship with, was no longer there. Adam where art thou? And I'm going to suggest that God today is, is, is saying the same thing to us. It is, where art thou? Dearly beloved, if you don't realize that you're a sinless new creation in Christ and that your fellowship, your walk, everything is based upon that reality, then you have my deepest sympathy. If you trace this do a word study just a simple word study and you look at how the the word light is used in relationship to truth right from the, the beginning when god said let there be light to to the very end of, of the book where we see that the nations are walking in the light of it the new jerusalem in which which manifests the very glory of god I think you'll be encouraged by what you find out. Dearly beloved, I'm out at our cemetery to get a point across. A simple point that so many Christians just don't want to even think about or talk about. Maybe it's because it's such a sens sensitive subject. And that subject is death. Dearly beloved, you're dead to sin. You're dead to the law. You're dead to the world. You're dead to Satan. You're dead to the flesh. You're dead to even death because if Christ died in, our, in your place, you will not die. Dearly beloved, give it some thought. You are dead. You can't walk up to any one of these individuals and talk to them and them hear you. Why? Because they're dead. 
we were spiritually dead, totally depraved, spiritually dead, dead in trespasses and sins. And it is it is it was when we were dead in trespasses and sins that Christ died for us. That's what the text says, dearly beloved. Chosen in him before the foundation of the world. But it doesn't stop at the at the a matter of redemption. Okay, our lives, our walk in Christ is to be one in which we recognize, we realize, we reckon ourselves dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dead to sin, dead to the law. Now, if you want to live according to the flesh, if you want to live according to law, if you want to walk and have a relationship with God Almighty, our Lord Jesus Christ, if that's, if, if that's what you want, is to walk in such a way as you, you recognize yourself as alive to sin, alive to the law, and all of that, then you are going contrary to Scripture, and not only that, but contrary to the most perfect illustration that God could ever give you concerning your relationship with Him. Take a look, folks, okay? You're dead. Dead to, the, dead to sin, dead to the law, dead to the world, dead to that world religious system. But you have been raised with Christ to walk in newness of life. You're not dead, okay? You're no longer dead. Look, I love you all. I truly do, and I appreciate all of your kind comments. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.